honeybee health and industrial agriculture, what researchers are missing, and why it's a problem. This is an audiovisual adaptation of an article published in the Journal of Insect Science in February of 2022. My name is Maggie Shanahan, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. The goal of this video is to encourage conversation both within and beyond the honeybee research community around the impacts of industrial agriculture so that we can fully engage in the transformative change needed to support honeybee health. This video will likely reach an interdisciplinary audience, so I'll start by defining a few terms. These are honeybees. They're common charismatic bees that are currently very important to certain aspects of our agricultural system in the U.S. Although they are sometimes used as a stand-in for all bees, the European honeybee is actually only one of over 20,000 bee species that exist in the world. These are beehives. A beehive is a house for a honeybee colony. You can think of a colony like a family unit. It contains one queen bee, tens of thousands of worker bees, male bees called drones, lots of baby bees, and hopefully a good amount of honey and pollen. Beekeeping is the practice of tending to these bees. That means different things in different contexts. People manage colonies for honey production, to pollinate crops, to connect with the natural world, and for a variety of other reasons. Many of you are probably aware that honeybees are having problems. Honeybees broke national news in 2006 with the advent of a mysterious syndrome that was termed colony collapse disorder. Though colony collapse disorder has since faded from the scene, honeybee colony loss continues to occur at alarming rates. Today, I'm going to talk about how honeybee researchers talk about that issue, what's missing from our discourse, and why this is a problem. The analysis I share here is centered in the United States, where much of my beekeeping and bee research experience has taken place, though I believe it to be relevant wherever honeybees interact with industrial agriculture. Let's dive in. In the U.S., when honeybee researchers talk about honeybee health, we often start by describing the following problem. Honeybee health is precarious, and colony losses occur at unsustainable rates. We then refer to a set of multiple interacting stressors to explain the causes of colony loss. Commonly known as the four Ps, these include parasites, pathogens, poor nutrition, and pesticides. We note that these stressors are complex and mutually reinforcing, we explain, for example, that a malnourished colony is more susceptible to parasites and pathogens, and that a diseased colony is less likely to be able to collect the resources it needs for adequate nutrition. Next, we reference some of the social, economic, and ecological implications of poor honeybee health. We talk about the ways in which this problem negatively affects honeybee well-being and beekeeper livelihoods. Sometimes we also mention that the spread of honeybee pathogens could spill over to native bees and other insects, which might negatively impact their health. Taking this one step further, we connect the importance of honeybee well-being and beekeeper livelihoods to our agricultural system, the food supply, and even global food security. This is the narrative that shapes most of the grants we apply for, the articles we write, and the actions we take to support honeybee health. It's clear cut. It's widely agreed upon. It's also missing something big. The framing we use to discuss honeybee health highlights the stressors that drive colony loss, but it doesn't talk about where those stressors come from. What changes when we change the way we frame this problem? What happens if, when we talk about honeybee disease and colony loss, we start with the problem of industrial agriculture? The problem of industrial agriculture, also known as intensive, conventional, or modern agriculture, is vast, unwieldy, and inextricably connected to destructive capitalist and colonial projects. For the purpose of this video, I will focus on one aspect of this problem, the way industrial agriculture impacts honeybee health. In order to understand the impacts of industrial agriculture, it helps to first orient towards diversified farming systems. In non-industrial, low-input, diversified farming systems, complex communities of plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi contribute to ecosystem functions that support sustainable food production. 
These include vital processes such as pollination, pest control, soil formation, and water regulation. To support their function, farmers must manage biodiversity at field, farm, and landscape scales. This kind of biodiversity and the vital processes it provides is generally absent from industrialized systems. Industrial agriculture is designed around two main goals, increased labor productivity, where the idea is to maximize output per worker, and increased yield, where the idea is to maximize output per plant or animal. Proponents of industrial agriculture argue that farmers must simplify and standardize crop production in order to achieve these goals. This means establishing monocultures and replacing ecosystem services with synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and other technological fixes. The simplification and standardization of agricultural landscapes can support increased yield, but these processes pose some major problems. First, they undermine biodiversity and erode the ecosystem functions that diverse plants and animals provide, increasing farmer dependence on off-farm inputs. Second, the industrialization of agriculture leads to consequences, or externalities, that extend far beyond crop fields. Some of these externalities include greenhouse gas emissions, viral spillover events, contaminated water supply, exploitation of workers, and, ironically, food insecurity. How does the industrialization of agriculture impact honeybee health? In diversified farming systems, farmers rely primarily on wild insects and other animals to pollinate their crops. These pollinators nest in and around agricultural landscapes, and their pollination services support abundant food production. In industrial agriculture, monocrop landscapes provide limited nesting habitat and forage resources, and pollinators are exposed to an abundance of agrochemicals. As a result, as agriculture intensifies, the overall abundance and richness of wild pollinators in agricultural landscapes decreases, and commercial beekeepers bring in honeybees to meet crop pollination needs. Because they pollinate a wide variety of plants, and because their colonies contain tens of thousands of individuals, honeybees are a relatively effective pollinator to mobilize and massify. When industrial agriculture manufactures a demand for pollination services, industrial beekeeping meets that demand. Every year, commercial beekeepers transport more than 2 million colonies around the United States to pollinate crops like almonds, apples, blueberries, and melons. Pollination contracts, in which beekeepers rent colonies to growers on a temporary basis to support crop yields, provide a vital source of income for many commercial beekeepers. These contracts lend some measure of economic stability to an increasingly precarious industry. But, while renting out colonies can be a lifeline for beekeepers, engaging with industrial agriculture is not good for bees. Industrial agriculture and industrial beekeeping expose honeybees to the multiple interacting stressors that lead to colony loss. Monocrop landscapes can provide honeybees with a lot of forage all at once, but the resources they offer are often short-lived and lacking in diversity and nutritional quality. As a result, the proliferation of monocrop landscapes contributes to poor nutrition in honeybees. Agrochemicals do further damage. Herbicides kill the so-called weeds that would otherwise provide important forage resources. Fungicides disrupt in-hive microbial communities and affect physiological processes critical to colony function. Insecticides impair the bees' ability to learn, communicate, and locate their homes, and adversely affect colony development. Even parasites and pathogens, stressors that seem separate from industrial agriculture, are exacerbated by this system. Housing honeybee colonies in crowded bee yards is a social distancing nightmare. High stocking densities contribute to increased pathogen transmission potential and create conditions that favor increased virulence. Moreover, migratory practices, the cross-country sale of honeybee packages in nucleus colonies, and the growing popularity of ho hobby beekeeping bring honeybees and the pathogens they carry to all corners of the country. Commercial beekeepers take great care to keep pathogen loads in check, but the conditions of industrial agriculture constantly up the ante. As a result, 
the spread of parasites and pathogens, on top of poor nutrition, on top of pesticides, makes keeping colonies alive a complicated endeavor. To review, when honeybee researchers frame honeybee health issues, we often focus on the fact that deteriorating colony health has negative consequences for our agricultural system. But when we consider the problem of industrial agriculture, we see that colony loss is actually the logical result of the way that we farm and the way we push honeybees to produce in conditions that are not designed to support their survival. When we broaden our framing, we find that industrial agriculture is not the victim of unsustainable colony loss. It's the cause. This is not actually new information. Sociologists, ecologists, geographers, agroecologists, journalists, and many beekeepers and farmers have provided critical analyses that describe this, quote, manifestly unsustainable system. Many of these analyses explicitly connect honeybee health issues to industrial agriculture and to the political, social, and economic structures that underlie this system. These resources are relevant to honeybee research because they help to describe the context in which honeybee health issues are situated. However, we honeybee researchers rarely cite our colleagues across disciplines. We focus on specific aspects of colony health, and we skip the broader context. Why does this matter? The way we frame a problem shapes the solutions that we implement. When we frame this problem as an issue with honeybee health rather than an issue with the industrial agricultural system, we undercut our research efforts and lend further support to an unsustainable status quo. This brings us to the canary part. Through years of focused research, honeybee scientists have developed a detailed understanding of many aspects of honeybee biology and colony health. This work often describes or addresses the negative impacts of industrial agriculture, but it seldom names this system explicitly. This is a problem because when we attempt to address honeybee health issues without acknowledging industrial agriculture as the underlying driver of colony loss, we run the risk of focusing our energy on partial fixes that make it only marginally more possible for honeybees to survive an inhospitable system. Here's another way to put that. The canary in the coal mine metaphor is commonly employed to warn of the catastrophic consequences of pollinator demise. In this metaphor, honeybees are often misused as a stand-in for all pollinators. Essentially, the story goes that if honeybees collapse, our food system will follow. We can extend this metaphor to illustrate the consequences of a framing that focuses on the stressors that cause honeybee disease without questioning the system that creates those stressors. In this case, if the honeybee is the canary, a narrow framing leads us to focus on the health of the bird instead of its surroundings. We see the canary, we know it's unwell, but instead of evacuating the coal mine and bringing the bird up to the surface for the fresh air that it needs, we scientists are setting up a more permanent camp inside the mine, hooking the canary up to oxygen, running diagnostic tests, supplementing the canary's diet to elevate its hemoglobin levels, and initiating a program to develop a canary that can survive on CO2. Our efforts may allow the canary to live a little longer, but focusing solely on individual aspects of canary health actually keeps us from asking more fundamental questions. Why are we keeping canaries in coal mines in the first place? Why are we still building coal mines at all? Attempting to support honeybee health without addressing the root causes of colony loss will not create the change we need. In order to address the larger issue, we must reframe our research. We must name industrial agriculture. As scientists, we reframe our research all the time. We do this to reach different audiences, tap into different funding sources, and contextualize our work to fit different publications. So, Broadening our framing of honeybee health issues to name industrial agriculture as a root cause of colony loss should not be much of a stretch. Let's walk through one example of what that might look like. When we introduce our research, we start by providing context. We then state the problem, and we talk about how our research will address that problem. Currently, when honeybee researchers talk about honeybee health, we start by stating that honeybees are essential pollinators in agricultural systems. Their co contribution to crop production is valued at so many billions of dollars. 
We then describe this problem. Colony loss is occurring at unsustainable rates. Colony loss results from multiple interacting stressors, which include X, Y, Z. And then we talk about how our research will help beekeepers and honeybees manage or overcome one or several of the multiple interacting stressors. A hypothetical reframe could look like this. We start by stating that the proliferation of industrial agriculture results in decreased abundance of wild pollinators. So growers across the country rent honeybee hives to meet pollination needs in large monocultures. We then describe this problem. Although this arrangement may improve yields in the short term, it ultimately exacerbates a series of multiple interacting stressors which negatively impact honeybee health. Here's where I stop and notice that shifting my framing does change the way I think about the research that I'm doing. Now that I've named industrial agriculture as a primary driver of colony loss, I must also acknowledge that my specific research focus is unlikely to make much of a difference in honeybee health outcomes absent structural change. That doesn't mean my research is useless, but I will have to think more deeply about how my actions fit into a broader strategy to promote honeybee health and how I can use my research to forward that strategy in a meaningful way. Changing our framing is simple. I only added a few sentences there, but it isn't easy. Why? Engaging with the root causes of colony loss exposes the need for bigger change, and big change can be hard to face. This brings us to the dangerous questions. The dangerous questions invite us to reassess the role of beekeeping and honeybee research in agricultural systems. For example, if we acknowledge that industrial agriculture and industrial beekeeping are bad for honeybee health, and we know that our goal is to move towards a food system that supports bee health, then what is the role of beekeeping in agriculture? If we transform agricultural landscapes in the United States so that they support wild pollinators and those wild pollinators support crop production, then will beekeeping have a significant role? What if the answer is no, not really, or not in a way that could support the livelihoods of the approximately 25,000 apiary workers currently employed in the United States? These questions don't just impact beekeepers, they affect honeybee researchers as well. In the long term, if saving the honeybee is less about drilling down on honeybee biology and behavior and more about food system transformation, then what is the role of honeybee research? Does it have a significant role? What if the answer is no, not really, or not in its current form? And in the short term, if honeybee researchers present a critique of the predominant agricultural system in the United States, the system that currently supports so much of our research, then what happens to our funding? These questions are dangerous because they represent an existential threat to all those that work within the existing system to support honeybee health. For many honeybee researchers, speaking openly about industrial agriculture may further seem off limits because engaging with the dangerous questions poses a problem not just for beekeepers, not just for researchers, but for beekeeper-researcher relationships. Researchers may worry that reframing this problem, implicating industrial agriculture and industrial beekeeping in colony loss, will hurt commercial beekeepers. These are people who we work with and care about. Our research is often oriented towards supporting them, and in many ways, their work gives our work meaning. If we speak openly about the negative impacts of industrial agriculture, will we alienate the people that work within that system? To answer this question, I think we have to remember that industrial agriculture is a complex system, one in which all of us, researchers, beekeepers, and farmers alike, are embedded. Beekeepers are acutely aware of the myriad problems that this system poses and work in their own ways to address them. Describing the impacts of industrial agriculture is not about blame. It's about getting clear about how this system works so that we can transform it together. It makes sense to be thoughtful about the way we discuss these issues. It makes sense to acknowledge that, for many, beekeeping is a labor of love, 
and current conditions make it difficult for bees, beekeepers, and beekeeping businesses to thrive. I think we can do this while also speaking openly about the root of the problems we collectively face. I believe that beekeepers, researchers, and beekeeper-researcher relationships are capable of holding that complexity, and that researchers' concern for commercial beekeepers' experience, while valid, should not distract us from also doing the work of understanding the ways in which our own actions, the actions of the honeybee research community, uphold industrial agriculture. If this line of thinking makes you feel uncomfortable, I want to say that I can relate. I study mechanisms that support healthy immune systems in honeybees, and that research is meaningful to me. I do believe that supporting honeybee immune health can improve colony health. And at the same time, I fear that offering this incremental solution in a system that no amount of immune support can salvage will just help bees be marginally more healthy so we can push them that much harder. In that sense, I fear I am also trying to resuscitate the canary. For a long time, it was hard for me to confront the broader systems that lead to such massive colony loss because of the implications that a reframe might have for my life and work. The scope of my research is limited. Like so many scientists, I've specialized. I've focused in on one tractable problem, hoping to make a small amount of positive change. I'm not an expert in agricultural systems. What can a scientist studying honeybee immune health contribute in the face of such a massive and tangled problem? Three important things. First, I can do my best to direct my research to support honeybee health within our current system. Second, I can engage with interdisciplinary scholarship and diverse knowledge systems to better understand the context in which my work is situated. Third, I can directly describe the origin of the problems that my research attempts to address. As I've established, the benefits of the first action will not have much impact unless we connect with the second and actualize the third. So here's the call to action. Honeybee researchers, name industrial agriculture in the grants you apply for, in the articles you write, and in the actions you take to support honeybee health. When you talk about colony loss, when you list the multiple interacting stressors, explain where those stressors come from. Take a closer look at industrial agriculture and name the problems it presents so that collectively, we can move towards transforming this system. This may not seem like much, or it may seem like too much, but when we consider the massive harms that industrial agriculture imposes on individuals, communities, and living systems, we find that telling the truth in honeybee research is both necessary and the barest of minimums. And if turning towards the dangerous questions is uncomfortable, turning away from them represents its own ex existential threat. When we normalize industrial agriculture, we are not just pushing honeybees to survive a system that doesn't support their survival. It's much more than that. When honeybee researchers describe the conditions of industrial agriculture, without calling into question the system that creates them, we lend legitimacy to the erroneous idea that industrial agriculture is an immutable system, when it is actually only one of many forms of food production. When we fail to acknowledge the broader context contributing to colony loss, we protect that toxic system from actual transformation. We're stuck making things work when we should be making them change and the consequences of these actions extend far beyond honeybee health to native bees, greenhouse gas emissions, viral spillover events, contaminated water supply, exploitation of workers, food insecurity, and beyond. Fortunately, there are ways forward. Beekeepers, farmers, individuals, communities, and organizations in the United States and all over the world are working to envision, enact, and defend alternatives to industrial agriculture, and to realize the social, political, and economic changes that must accompany their widespread implementation. These efforts are supported by ample research which demonstrates that so-called alternative farming systems, including the many varied and often overlapping forms of indigenous, traditional, diversified, regenerative, and agroecological farming systems, support abundant food production 
and can help to repair many of the harms imposed by industrial agriculture. Efforts to enact these alternatives are inherently interdisciplinary. They connect food systems transformation to broader social and political movements for justice, such as indigenous land and seed sovereignty initiatives and efforts to eradicate racism from the food system. When honeybee researchers recognize industrial agriculture as the root cause of honeybee health issues, we open ourselves to the opportunity to collaborate meaningfully in these movements and contribute to the future that must be built. We add our voices to the growing chorus that knows and insists that industrial agriculture is not the only way. It's one way. It's a way that was made. It's a thing we can change. The question is whether we open up and let that change happen through us or dig in our heels until that change happens to us. Thank you.